Well, good morning. I was a little feeble. <laughs> yeah, let's try that again. Good morning. That's kind of a habit I have to say it again when it's weak, just to make sure you're at least a little awake. Welcome to everyone here. Deep down inside each one of us, way down deep, is a God-planted desire, longing, I would say even a passion. It's kind of a factory set that we've been made with, a virtue of being human. And this preset, this desire, requires external input for us to develop social security and social grace. If the input is not provided, or if it is rejected for some alternative, Social development is stunted at best and mutated at worst. And I call this deeply organic preset brotherhood. And I want to write that up here on the board so you can look at the word while we talk. <clears throat> talk about those little letters later. I'm going to make one claimer and one disclaimer. One claimer is that this is a area in my life that I feel like I have a lot of external input to accept that I haven't done to this point. I'm 50 couple years old, uh, pushing 60 really hard, and there's a lot of things that I look back on my life and think, well, so where was I all this time? Five decades, more than five decades of just missing some important things. I'm not going to try to explain it or excuse it. I'll, I'll accept it as a fact and ask God to help me go from here. The disclaimer is that if you feel like I'm talking to you, just forget it. I'm talking to myself and take that as God telling you something and learn from it. <clears throat> it's, it's the Spirit of God speaking to you. I feel like He is to me. I'll give you just two memories that, um, one of them is real recent, one of them several years ago, that I wouldn't say spark this, but kind of egg this whole idea on in my mind. Uh, the neighbor, Chad Hummer down here, doesn't have a car, so he likes a ride to town. So in an effort to be a neighbor to him, I've done that, although I know it hasn't always been uh, used for his good. Um, <clears throat> I've made clear to him what I intend for him, but you know, if he can lie and cover that up, I'll still be a neighbor. But here recently, um, well, I've noticed that he likes to give reasons to go to town that he knows I will like to get me to take him. I just kind of excuse the reason, decide whether I can or not. But here recently, he's been saying he wants to go to the harbor, which is a place in town for people with addictions. And of course, he knows that I want to help him get over his addictions. And so he wants to go to the harbor. There's a lot of places not far from the harbor that he likes to go to that are not the harbor. So anyhow, so I'll drop him off at the harbor and, and leave. And I try to follow up, find out a little bit sometimes next time, you know, what happened, not too much. But recently it's been getting a little more intense, so I've been, been a little more direct with him. And so the one time I took him to the harbor, he wanted to go, he was going to go do some paperwork. We pulled in, and sometimes I'll just drop him off and keep going. This time I pulled in and went in the parking lot. Uh, that 
I can tell when he gets a little nervous. And then I said, well, I'm going to get out and see if they have brochures here about this place. Uh, it's, so he gets out, and, and I can tell he's a little flustered, and so I want to know where the main entrance is, and he's kind of looking around. I'm, well, shoot, you've been here a few times, haven't you? <laughs> but anyhow, well, then he shows me where it says entrance, and so I go, he says, well, it's locked. Well, so I'm curious how he knows that. But anyhow, so, yeah, it is locked. Well, there's some people just up the street a little bit that are working in a flower bed. And one of them starts walking toward us and gets up to, to Chad. And Chad goes, oh, hello, brother. Um, that's the point of the story right there. The fellow is someone that works there. He said, do you need some help and all that kind of stuff? Well, they had a little conversation. They got his name and number. It felt like for the first time. But I thought about that. So what's this thing of calling this person brother? You know, I know Chad. I didn't know this person. But apparently there's, there's something about this brother thing that was important. A more serious conversation I had several years ago when some of you might remember Daniel Conley was around. Um. He visited our place one time, and we, we got to talking about things, and he was a, he had been a Navy SEAL in the military, and I'm not sure how our discussion got to this point, but he made the comment that there is a strong pull for him. I don't think he ever planned to go back, but there was a pull for him to go back into to being a Navy SEAL, and I was kind of curious about that, you know. You know, where is he with non-resistance and all that? Well, that, that part was clear to him. That's why he wasn't a Navy SEAL. But he said the one thing that he misses the most is the brotherhood. Well, I thought that was interesting. I, I don't, didn't know anything about the Navy SEALs. And I think it was sometime after that, um, I was talking with um, Brian Otto while he was a neighbor, and he was reading a book, and I, I didn't ask him, I should have asked him what the title of the book was, but he came across the same thing in there, that in the military, and I don't know if he was talking about Navy SEALs, that there is this thing of brotherhood that is very strong in that setting. <clears throat> so, and I want to talk about brotherhood, I'd like to give it a definition, um, a description, and then talk about how, you know, how does that affect us or how should we respond? My own experience with brother is rather small and rather narrow. Probably my, my biggest experience is church life and school life. You know, we call our pastors brother so-and-so and our elder people brother so-and-so. We never got into calling our teenage friends, you know, brother this and brother that. When I went to school, went to a Christian school, and we called our teachers brother, well, brother John was my teacher, brother Melvin, and to this day, I still use that term. And most of the time, when I use that term and think of it, I think of it as mostly a term of honor and respect, not necessarily a close relationship like I, I'm hearing it used maybe in the military or with someone going up. Chad going up to somebody and say, hey, brother. When I was at camp, we had the we had black boys there. I forget which is the PC word for black, but anyhow. Um, and they would often refer to each other as, yo, bro. And you hear it in different settings like that. So it, it was more of a title in my experience than it was a, a relationship. I did grow up in a family where I have brothers, you know, I have a, a brother Philip and a brother Stephen and a brother Braxton and a brother Michael and I have some sisters. Uh, by the way, I'm not leaving you guys out over here by saying brotherhood. It's, you can put sisterhood in that if it helps. <clears throat> and when I think of those, I don't necessarily think of calling them brother Braxton and brother Philip, but I do think of them as brothers. Okay, there, there is something there that will never go away. It will always be there. Well, what is brotherhood? Um, 
I don't always look in dictionaries for terms because dictionaries have, I mean, they're helpful, but sometimes they're frustrating. But I'm going to give you a definition, and I want you to get this. Listen close to this definition for brotherhood. The quality or state of being brothers. That is a real eye-opener, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I hope the sarcasm doesn't hit you too hard. I hate definitions that use the same word. But it does tell us it is a condition. It's a state of being. So I do want you to pick up that part. Another definition it gives is a group of persons formally joined together for some common interest. That one, um, when I think of like motorcycle gangs, you know, they call each other brother. I sort of think of that brotherhood in that sense. They have a common interest of motorcycles and whatever else goes along with it. And, and, you know, all that stuff. They they, they all get together on that. A similar definition is community of interest, activity, feeling, and or experience. The part of that definition that caught my eye, caught my attention, was that experience part. And we will talk more about that later. But brotherhood, I believe, at its core, has a lot to do with common experience. When I think of my brothers, Braxton, and Philip, and Stephen, that's part of what that is. We all had a lifetime of similar experiences, a lot of life, and that has something to do with our brotherhoodness. We've went separate ways, but when we get together, if we're together any amount of time, there's almost always something comes up from our experience together that that gets referred to or discussed at length. Here are uh, two more abstract definitions that I found. that I think are often how the brotherhood term is used kind of in general. The belief, did you know brotherhood was a belief? Feeling or hope that all people should regard and treat one another as equals. That's an interesting concept of brotherhood. It's a belief that everyone should be treated as equal. And here's another one. The affection and loyalty that you feel for people you have something in common with. All of these definitions are an attempt at capturing something. And that something is a very deep part of us, a very deep longing, a very deep desire. And I find these definitions sort of pushing at the surface. And so we'd like to go a little bit deeper. Another term that I'm going to use interchangeably here for a little bit with brotherhood is community. I I think there can be some difference there, but I'm going to use them somewhat interchangeably. And I got a hold of a a small book by Eberhard Arnold, who, if I understand right, was one of the founders of the Bruderhof community. And he, this book is called Why We Live in Community. So I'm going to pick a few things out of there that I think capture some of this brotherhood part of our preset. <clears throat> he says the reason that they live in brotherhood is because the struggle of life against death demands the united ranks of souls and bodies that can be mobilized wherever death threatens life. I'll read that again. We live in community because the struggle of life against death demands the united ranks of souls and bodies that can be mobilized wherever death threatens life. That that captured my... um, fascination in my discussion with Daniel Conley and and people that are in the military talking about brotherhood because they are up against life and death situations. And it seems that that, in a sense, creates a brotherhood feeling. 
The key elements that um, Eberhardt says are part of community are a community of goods, like a community of resources that are used for a cause. Another element, a key element, is loyalty to the end, a commitment that will always be there until we're finished. And another one is subordination to the whole, a humility and a submission to the big cause. And these are things that have came up in in our Sunday school. We're talking about love one another, love our brother. Another statement that he made in this book, he says an organism becomes a unit through the unity of consciousness brought about by the spirit that animates it. And let me read that one again. Some of these I had to look at several times, and here I am throwing them at you and expecting you to absorb all this, but I'll I'll read that one again. I want you to think about what it means. An organism becomes a unit through the unity of consciousness brought about by the spirit that emanates it. Wendell was up here talking about the spirit, and in Sunday school we were talking about trying spirits. It's a very important part of this whole thing. And again, I hope to touch on that a little later too. I sort of sum these things up that that I got from this book by Eberhard is that we are not a community simply to be a community or put brotherhood in there. We are not a brotherhood simply to be a brotherhood, but because there is a cause that is bigger than any one of us. And I'm going to translate that into the military. There isn't any military out there that has just one man to do the fighting. There is no such thing as a one-man army. The causes are too big. Okay? It takes several. <clears throat> it takes a big army sometimes. Or in the case of the Navy SEALs, they have missions that take a group of people, a smaller group of people. But no one of them can do it themselves. We're not a community simply to be a community, but because the cause is bigger than any one of us. I did um, look up uh, this brotherhood in the Navy SEALs just to see what I could find. And here are some statements that were made, most of them, I think, by a, a fellow that had been a Navy SEAL, maybe a commander in a Navy SEAL. Uh, so some of them were at least associated with him. And another one, I think, with a story that Dad told his boys about Navy SEAL relationship. But here are some of the phrases that came out. An unbreakable bond. When they talked about this brotherhood, they talked about an unbreakable bond. There is nothing going to come along that's going to break the bond that they have. Having the team members back 100% of the time. Like, no matter what's coming along, you will always have each other's back. You will be there for each other. Nothing's going to separate the support that we give. The team comes before the individual, or the team members subjugate individual needs to the needs of the group. Like, the needs of the group, of us together, are going to be first over my own individual needs. If I'm thirsty, that means one thing. But if the team is thirsty, that's another thing. The good of the tribe rises above individual preferences. What's going to make the group function at its best is what comes first, not a preference that I have about how we're going to do this. And you will always take care of your buddy. Some of them overlap a little bit. And there's a quote that... um, again, I understand, comes from a movie called Act of Valor that kind of says what the standard of this brotherhood is. It goes like this. There is a brotherhood between us, and if you're not willing to give up everything, you've already lost. That is a really high standard for this brotherhood. 
There's brotherhood, and if you're not willing to give up everything, you've already lost. <clears throat> Another thing I'd like to do um, before I go any further is just do a quick overview of the Bible. Very quick, very brief, just to kind of put the, the Bible in this kind of a framework. So what is brotherhood? What does it mean? How does it fit into our lives? <clears throat> Remember, I said this is a, a God-planted desire, a God-planted longing, and actually a God-planted passion. It's something that's set in us that we can't change, this whole thing of brotherhood or community. So starting back at clear in Genesis, when God created the world and man, the first thing that he told man to do was be fruitful and multiply. And I wasn't there, so I, I don't know exactly how it all developed, but it seems like God gave that command to Adam before Eve came along, when I read the thing. And when I realized that, I got this it was sort of a humorous picture of the next scene where God takes all these creatures and makes them go in front of Adam. I don't know what all Adam knew, but I, he was the first man. He was there with God. I think he knew something that this was not possible on his own. Like, I can't do this myself. And so God had all these animals pass before him, and he gave them all a name. And it, was really, it really jumped out at me that when he got to the end, the comment was, there isn't any of them there for me. I think Adam was supposed to be picking out a partner to fill this command because he couldn't do it himself. The cause was bigger than him. God created him that way. And so then God went about the process of making Eve. And when Adam sees Eve, she didn't go, he didn't go brotherhood, but same thing as bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Here is somebody that I can partner with, that I can commit myself to, and we can meet the cause that God has given us. We call it marriage. Right now you can think of it as brotherhood or marriagehood, whatever, whatever you want to call it. It's a partnership, a commitment. The next thing that really stands out to me about brotherhood in the story of the Bible is when we get to the Tower of Babel story. And God looks down, and he sees all these people, and he says, they are as one. And what comment does he make about that? Nothing will be withheld from them. There is power in unity and brotherhood. God created us that way. If we are going to experience the potential that we are designed for, we're going to be in brotherhood. And when we get in that, God says they'll be able to do whatever they want to do. They can fulfill every imagination of their heart. I don't, I don't even quite know how to interpret that. That's big. Well, God took care of that problem because he knew they weren't going to do good things with it. The next story is a, a very small story, but I think it's another story of brotherhood. When Ab Abraham and Lot finally left Ur and left their dad and went down into Canaan and they had this squabble and they split Lot went toward Sodom Abraham I guess went into the mountains and then there was this battle that Lot gets hauled off all his family gets hauled off and gets carried captive and suddenly we have a story of brotherhood strong brotherhood where Abraham says I have Lot's back and he takes 300 men. It's the first Gideon story in the Bible, if you never thought of this before. 318 men exactly. He takes against five kings and their army and recovers everything. Lot and his family and all his stuff. A demonstration of brotherhood. From then on, the story changes a little bit. God actually formally takes a group of people out of Egypt to Sinai, and I'm going to call it creates a brotherhood. Gives them laws, says, I'm your, 
I'm your leader, gives them, give them Moses as their kind of leader, and says, this is how I want you to act, and establishes a brotherhood. And then he gives them a land where they can, where they can live this out. And from then on, it's a rather pathetic story. From Judges clear to Malachi, this whole brotherhood thing is basically a fiasco. It's a disaster. It's a pathetic human attempt to keep this thing going and God's continual comment on how they're failing and what they need to do to make it work. And we get to the New Testament. And God sends Jesus. And there's an interesting comment in the beginning of John where it says, Jesus came to his own, and his own did not receive them. That really stood out to me while I was thinking about this. Here, Jesus came to his brothers, and they rejected him. I suddenly got this feeling of how terrible that might have been. Not, not as, I don't think as terrible as it really was, but the reality of Jesus coming to a group of people that he had been part of setting up. They were supposed to be operating under his plan, his father's plan, and he's coming to his own people, and they reject him. That must have been really hard. He was coming because he had their backs, but they didn't have his back. They left him go. <clears throat> Jesus gets to the end of his life, and the prayer he makes at the end is an amazing prayer. Every time I read it and think about it, I'm, I'm amazed. After all that he had experienced, coming to his own and they rejected him, he still prays to his father and says, I'm coming here, I'm finishing the work that you gave me to do so that all those who believe in me can have brotherhood with me and you. We can be one. We can be part of this unit. That was his prayer. And then we have Acts, the upper room experience where God sent his spirit. And now we're talking about this spirit that Eberhard Arnold says that brings about this. Comes in and lives in them. And we have the story of what happened out of that. And I would just like to look at that in Acts chapter 2. Familiar passage, but I'd like to read. What happened when this spirit drove this brotherhood? Acts chapter 2, the last several verses, starting in verse 40, 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. There's, here's a 3,000 size brotherhood. And this is what it looked like. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. There's, there's a word that you can put in with this brotherhood. In their fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. There we have this thing we saw in this definition about this common interest. Or Eberhard Arnold talked about community of goods. Here we have it happening. And sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So... One of the initial characteristics come out is a just a coming together in, in every possible way. And jumping over to chapter 4. In verse oops, 30. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did any say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. 
And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. And I think somewhere here it says by now there was like another several thousand, 5,000 souls. Okay, again, they had all things in common. This brotherhood meant that what's mine is yours, and what's yours is mine. We, we all use it together. <clears throat> Hebrews 11, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, ends with this statement. And I'll just read it, the last verse. It's a brotherhood that transcends time. And all these, after this list of men of faith, and all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise... God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Did you know that Abraham has your back? That Moses has your back? That David has your back? All those people have their back, have your back. And did you know that you have their back? That's a goosebump thought to me, that this whole, this whole process that God has put together is a brotherhood, not just of our congregation now, that's, that's our real life thing now, but it's a brotherhood of a group that extends from the beginning of time to the end. And this whole thing is not going to be complete until we all do our part. We all invest our resources and we all take the resources that have been left us and use them for this huge cause that God has. God made us to be a brotherhood of all time. The epistles tells us what that cause is. That cause is the restoration of brotherhood of mankind that was lost to Adam. He, Paul um, especially in Corinthians, I notice he talks about that is our ministry, a ministry of reconciliation, a ministry of restoration to a brotherhood with God, a brotherhood with Christ. That's why Jesus came, because he needs this to fill this big cause that goes from Adam to Revelation. And Revelation is a triumph of this brotherhood. In the end, this brotherhood that God is creating is going to win. And sin is going to be gone, and we are going to have pure, perfect fellowship and brotherhood with God and with His Son and with each other. So that's a, that's a quick framework of the Bible. So just a quick analysis of brotherhood in this picture we've created. It is a passionate desire for unity, for oneness. Jesus had that, and it's in us. A concerted focus on a cause. All of us focusing together on one thing. And I want to present that cause as a person, as Jesus. An unadulterated commitment to the cause or to everyone involved, to that person and to each other as we focus on that. A commitment that will never change, that will never back up, that will always be in the front. And an unfailing courage to maintain that focus, that attraction to the person and the cause and to the team and to ignore all the distractions. That one I find is a big challenge to me. And I think the best way to ignore the distractions is to keep a focus on the main attraction. <clears throat> So let's look at a few examples from the Bible and then a few examples that I found in some of the stories that I read about the Navy SEALs. And we're not going to turn to all of these because most of them are very familiar. Probably the one that captures my attention the most when it comes to brotherhood is the story of David and Jonathan and what it says right at the beginning. So the story is David goes and kills Goliath and the children of Israel have this amazing victory. 
And David gets called in to Saul. And while he's in there, it makes this comment. It says, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And one translation I read said that is why Saul did not let David go home after that. I don't quite know how all that plays in there. But it says their soul was knit. And I ask myself many times, so why? Why suddenly at that meeting were these brothers just like that, it seems like? Well, then I remember that there was a story that happened a while before this, when Saul was kind of leading the kingdom before David came on the scene. And I'm sure you've all read this story, but it's another kind of another David and Goliath story. So Saul was scared sitting under this tree with a bunch of men just shivering about the Philistines. And Jonathan's over here. And finally he says, well, he tells his armor, hey, let's, let's climb this bank. And if the Philistines say this, we're going to charge. And if they don't, we'll back up. And so he went up there and the Philistines said, come on out. And they went and drove them all out. And they had a great victory. And I think Jonathan saw the same spirit in David that he had followed that day. And those two men clicked just like that. And they were brothers the rest of their lives. David always could depend on Jonathan for encouragement when he was even running from Jonathan's father. It says Jonathan would come out and encourage him. And Jonathan always looked for the day when David would become king and Jonathan would be one of his men. That, that, was, that was their commitment. And David committed to always taking care of Jonathan and his family. So there, there was an example of extreme brotherhood in David's life. And even David's men that he had with him, when he started running from Saul, says he had 400 men, and I don't think it was quite the same kind of brotherhood. I think there was some of that there. But the description is, is that all these were men that were in trouble with the nation, uh, probably with Saul in some way. They had a common interest, and they hung together. It, it came to be 600 men, his, his rebel band. And they, they would go and, and fight the Philistines and, and win battles with them. Every, everyone they fought won. Saul was struggling to keep his nation together. But here were these men hanging together like brothers. Out of those 600 men, you've probably read about the three. How many of you have ever read about David's three men? Okay, a few of you. You should read that. It's interesting. These were men that were seemed especially close to David. You do remember this story, I think, where one time they were kind of in a battle or a standoff, and David's like, thirsty for a drink of water from the well at Bethlehem, I think it was. And these three men, I guess, realized the, the need of the group at this point was water for their leader. And so they break through the Philistine lines, get some water, and bring it back to David. Do you remember what David did with that? He poured it on the ground. I've, when, I've, when I first heard that story, it's like, if I'd been one of those three men, I think I'd have, I don't know what I would have done to David. Like, here, I just risked my life to get you this water you needed. But they understood brotherhood, and David understood brotherhood. These men didn't go get water for themselves. Aren't they just as thirsty as I am? Why? Should I let my preference be bigger than the preference of these men? And so I think that's some of the understanding he had when he poured it out. They were brothers. They were together in this. If he was thirsty, his men were probably thirsty. Why shouldn't they get a drink? And then there's the 30, a, a, a bigger group. Doesn't seem like they were quite as close, but he had 30 men out of these 600 that performed amazing things for their group in different military things. And one of those, actually I think it was one of the three that spared David's life at the end of his life when they were fighting the Philistines and this, there was a giant had him prisoner the way I understand and was going to finish him off. And one of these three men came and slew that man and saved David. <clears throat> and they said, you're never going to battle again. I don't know how all that worked out. But a brotherhood where... 
All of our resources are pulled together to meet the cause, in this case, the cause of David's kingdom. In the New Testament, we have Jesus. And I guess I never, never took the time to think about Jesus' experience here as brotherhood. But he chose 12 men to walk close to him. I think it was a unique kind of brotherhood because he, he told them one time, I have chosen you. You haven't chosen me. I picked you out. I handpicked you to be my, my brothers, to be my men. And they did things together. And one of the stories that came to my mind was when Jesus was talking some really hard stuff about eating my flesh and drinking my blood and people were arguing and saying, there's something a matter with this man. And finally, some of them said, oh, we're, we're out of here. This, this, is not, this is not what we're interested in. And he looked at his 12 and he said, are you going to leave? And what did they say? Well, Peter, their spokesman, says, where else would we go? They had accepted this brotherhood as their life. They said, there's, there's no other place for us to go. You have what we want. Even with this hard stuff, we're sticking together. And Jesus made it very clear that there is nothing in this life that takes priority over him and the cross that he stands for. He told them, you need to give up father, mother, brother, sister, land, and even your own life if you want to be in my brotherhood. You want to be one of my disciples. It costs you everything. And I like that statement I made. If you're not willing to give it all up, you've already lost. It's basically what Jesus said. He who loses his life will find it. But if you try to save your life, you will lose it. <clears throat> and at communion, we have feet washing. And I guess I, I, I put this in that framework and it, kind of made it come a little more real. When Jesus took and washed his disciples' feet, he was taking a position as a brother. He said, yeah, I'm your master and your Lord, but if I have served you and I'm willing to wash your feet as a brother, that's what you need to do. That's the example I set. Brotherhood, a closeness, a willing to be there to help each other stay clean help each other stay pure, to help each other stay true to the cause, to help each other stay committed to each other, to be there. And when he left, when he went to heaven and gave them the great commission, his last words to them were, I will be with you always. Even though his body left, he says, I'm going to be here with you. I'm not leaving you. There's no one left behind in this kind of brotherhood. We stick together, and Jesus says, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be with you, clear to the end, clear to the end of the age. And then we have the church. We already read. The demonstration of that was they, they pulled all the resources together to meet the needs that are around them. The apostles were, were committed when it came that they needed more help, they picked out more men to take care of it so they could keep committed as, as a group to meet all the needs. The apostles wanted to kept pre needed to keep preaching, but these widows needed taken care of, so they pulled their resources together to meet the need, to stay loyal to the cause. Jesus said, No man has a love that is greater than this, than to lay down his life for his friend or for his brother. <clears throat> The two stories that I read in the Navy SEALs that, that capture some of this, one of them was a team that went on a mission to, to capture whatever it was. I don't know all the details, but this one man went in, and he got shot in the head and was killed by someone hiding in a wall. So he died being loyal to the cause. One of his team members, when he realized what happened, he went in to bring his body out, and he got shot. So he wasn't necessarily dying directly for the, the big cause, but he was dying for a cause that was part of their cause, and that was to be loyal to his brother. 
So those two died, but they were both carried out by other team members. No one gets left behind. They all get they all pull out together, if at all possible. <clears throat> Another group um, was on a mission, and apparently, I don't know if they were up on a roof or whatever they were doing, but one of them saw a grenade lying on the roof and realized that that grenade was going to go off and then it was going to damage the rest of the group. And so, like, almost instinctively, he throws himself on the grenade, it goes off, saves everybody else, of course he dies. <clears throat> so he died to protect the rest of the team so they could, they could finish their mission. And this is what the one fellow says about it. All we can do is guess what Mikey was thinking, that was his name. He was never able to say. But I'm betting he understood exactly what he was dying for when he jumped on that grenade. And I'm sure Mikey had never discussed that possibility or predicted how he might respond. It was inherent inside of him somewhere. It came from his heart, was displayed in his actions, and lived on far longer than words. Brotherhood isn't something that we can particularly plan, something that we can say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. But it is that thing inside of us, that, that preset, that longing, that desire that God gives us, that gets expressed in how we relate to the people around us. And again, like I said at the beginning, if we ignore the input or we don't respond to that, we stunt our own social growth, our own social development, or we mutate it and we become something we don't want to be, which we'll talk about a little bit later. <clears throat> um, Denver was the man that wrote this. He wrote this, he says, the bravest acts I have witnessed and the most heroic acts I have performed occurred as a warrior put his own life in mortal danger to help a besieged team member to safety. When we are committed to brotherhood that way, where there's nothing that will turn us away, we'll do things beyond ourselves, do acts that we haven't planned, do acts that we don't even really know the outcome, because we're part of something that is bigger than us. <clears throat> and he said it this way, the love for one's country expressed through total commitment to teammates serving that country is what this brotherhood is. Okay, this, this brotherhood is an expression to our team members of our loyalty to the cause. So what are some of the enemies of brotherhood? The first one I'm going to mention I don't think is the greatest one, but I think it is one, and I'm going to call it institutionalization. That's a big word. Basically, managed brotherhood versus something more organic. And I will read what Thomas Merton commented about Eberhard Arnold's book, Why We Live in Community. He gives a bit of an interpretive talk on it, and this is what he said. It's kind of a long piece, but I'll read it, try to read it slowly and see if you can follow. He's talking about their, their community that they began, I think the beginning of the Berthoff when it was small. As we open up to more people outside the old community, we tend to form other communities. And again, community and brotherhood I'm using interchangeably here. You find grounds of sympathy, people with a new look and a whole new background, and you are stimulated by the first contacts, and perhaps you become more involved with them than your own community. This happens and is actually normal. The reason for it is probably because we are also in the midst of swinging away from an old situation in which community was rather abstract, abstract and what you really had was an organized institution instead of a real community. You had a lot of rules and everything was all set and people did the same thing at the same time and were in the same place at the same time and acted as a community. And probably there was a great deal of charity present in that way of life. But it was also quite possible in this perfect institution to hide an almost total absence of true community. It did cut down on big problems but in a way it created even bigger problems. The fact that everything was so much like a machine made it possible to go through all the motions without 
any real love or at least without any deep personal love for the people you lived with. So one of the, one of the enemies, one of the enemies of brotherhood and community is when it becomes sort of a routine and we lose, I will call it, that commitment to each other. It's more of a commitment maybe to a way of doing something than it is a commitment to the people involved. And we lose the passion for the person of the cause and to a form of the cause. But I don't believe that is the most powerful enemy against brotherhood. <clears throat> Eberhardt gives a list that goes a little bit like this. Temporal mood swings or temperamental mood swings is a danger, danger to community. Like today I feel like being your brother, today I don't. Today you get on my nerves, today uh, we agree. He said that that kind of temperamental mood swing is a enemy of community. These are personal vices that he lists. Possessive impulses. The impulse to say, this is mine. Okay? Be careful how you use that. Or, no, you may not use that. Or, if you do use it, um, you're accountable to me. Okay? I, I hold the rights to it. Physical and emotional satisfaction, or I should say personal physical and emotional satisfaction. Make sure that I am physically satisfied. I feel comfortable. Or my emotions are not being stressed right now. Okay? Make, make sure that's clear. That's a, a threat to brotherhood. Personal ambition. This is what I want to accomplish. That can happen even in a brotherhood or a community. I, I want this to happen my way. You know, we'll still be a brotherhood, but I want to get the credit for this. Personal influence over others. You know, I want to be the one that influences how we all act here. Okay? Those are all enemies of brotherhood. The one that I think is probably the most dangerous enemy of brotherhood is self-sufficiency. I can do this on my own. I really don't need your help. Yeah, you could help, but, but I, I, I got this. You know, why, why bother you? I can do this. Jesus said one time to a man who did that, who tore down his barns and built greater so that he could have it easy, he said, you are a fool. Tonight you're going to die. Then whose is all this going to be? The implication is, why don't you give it to them now? Okay? Take care of your brother. He also said, don't take thought for taking care of yourself. The clothes you're going to wear, the food you're going to eat, don't bother with that stuff. Seek my kingdom first, seek me, my cause, and I will give this to you. I'm your brother. I can meet your needs, and you can pursue me and my cause. All of this will be added to you. He told another man that came and said, what must I do to have eternal life? Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and follow me. Self-sufficiency, being able to do it myself, I think is the most powerful enemy against brotherhood and community. <clears throat> Jesus talked about the, the weedy soil and the, the parable of the soil and the sower. The people that were distracted by the cares of life or the pleasures of this world said so they, don't, they don't bear fruit. There's, there's not brotherhood. They're distracted. And another point that Eberhard Arnold brings out, and I've thought about this, and I, I think there's a reality to it. I'm not sure where to put it. I said self-sufficiency, I think, is the most dangerous one. This one might be right up there with that. But a lack of faith in a higher power. And I, I'm still pondering that, and I think there's, there's a lot of truth in that. In that passage that I talked about, Hebrews 11, where it has these men of faith, there is this statement that he makes. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Well, how do we please God? I think brotherhood is tied with pleasing God immensely and being part of a group that is pursuing what he wants to happen. And if we do not have faith in God, we cannot be part of that. We cannot be part, especially of this big one I talked about where 
All the men of faith in all of time are part of this brotherhood. And not one of them can, can pull out and say, yeah, well, you guys can do it. They're all in it together. And, Jesus, and God says it's not going to be complete until we're all there. Trusting each other begins, I believe, with trusting in God. Then we can trust each other in brotherhood. So lack of faith in this higher power, lack of faith in Jesus and what he has done for us and the work he has for us. <clears throat> so what is the secret of brotherhood? I think it is that spirit that we talked about at the beginning, that spirit that animates this organism. If we do not have that spirit, we cannot be part of that brotherhood. So I believe there are a lot of brotherhoods out there. There are a lot of causes. There are a lot of spirits. And in Sunday school, we talked about trying the spirits. If I want to be a part of the brotherhood that is part of God's plan, I need to have God's spirit. And that's what part of being converted is all about. Letting letting us be born again, having his spirit, becoming a new creature that recognizes the brotherhood of all of us that have that spirit. I like the verse in Romans chapter 12 where it says we get a new mind. And I think that spirit and mind there, I don't know if we can interchange them, but that new spirit is what governs our mind. And we think differently about each other. We don't see each other as threats. We see each other as brothers, as working together. And I know I need that spirit to work a whole lot more in my life. Totally sell out to that spirit like the disciples did. Where else are we going to go? You have the spirit that we want. You have the promise that God has given us. We don't want to turn to anything else. That's the spirit I want. And then give my whole body, my whole being, everything I am, and let that spirit govern how it's going to work, as Paul talks about, yielding our members to that righteousness. So how can I be a part of bringing brotherhood alive right here at Shippensburg Christian Fellowship? Well, I think for me, that means to identify, try the spirit that is in me. Is it a spirit that wants to be loyal to my brothers, loyal to the people that I know are dedicated to the same cause? Or, like I mentioned, the temptation to hold a brother at arm's length, say, well, can I trust him? If that's the case, I've already lost. That's, that's how that works. <clears throat> We all need to be driven by God's Spirit and encourage each other to spend the time with God that is necessary to cultivate a sensitivity to that Spirit. I feel like I need that a lot, is encouragement to take whatever time I need to be connected to that Spirit. Sometimes it might be time with a brother. Other times it might just be time alone with God, being open, talking to Him, telling Him everything that's going on and letting Him talk to me, being open to His voice spending that time. Another thing that I think is important is to make sure that I have a clear picture of the mission that Jesus has for me, for us as a brotherhood. Do I know what it is right here in Shippensburg, right here in Fellowship Acres, right up there at Blue Mountain Woodcraft? When I go to town, do I have that vision clearly in my mind? Do I know what God's calling is on my life? Discuss it. Discuss it among ourselves. Do I know what I'm doing that is continuing the work that Jesus started? Or what I'm doing distracting from that? And do I really believe that I need you all? That we all need each other to fill this mission? Are we willing to make all of our resources available to each other all the time? always committed to whatever I have that will help your part of the mission, it's available. Whatever you have is available to me. Is that always open? Acknowledge that we do have a dependent on each other. I am not a one-man show. I'm not a one-man Christian. I'm not a one-man Jesus preacher. I'm not a one-man evangelist. We are in this together, and we need each other. What will I do? To inspire that. That's a question I want to leave with me 
and I want to leave with you. What will I do today and tomorrow to inspire that brotherhood that goes deep, that fills the longing and the desire that God has put in each one of us? Let's bow our heads for prayer. God, I thank you for your spirit that has spoken to me. And Lord, help me to be open to the actions that you want me to take to change the way I think, to change the way I act, and to help build brotherhood among us as a congregation. And Lord, I pray that for each one of us. And I pray that as we go through this next week, your spirit will just show show us things that encourage us, that convict us, and that change us. And I pray this in the name of your son who died for us. Amen. And we can stand and have, oh, let me open it up first, and then we can stand and have a song. Is there any comments? Oh, yes, thank you. I about always do that. This means, by the way, doing it yourself is not cool. Okay? Excuse the slang at the end. <laughs> All right. Yes. I feel like I've done that way too much, tried to do things on my own. And my testimony is it is not cool. It's stressful. It's frustrating. Anyone else have a comment you want to make? Mm-hmm. <clears throat>